everyone. I am Terry Gilman, and I am the owner of Creating Conversations. And I am delighted to welcome you to tonight's event with Lori Frankel and Amy Einhorn. Uh, we will be talking about Lori's latest book, One, Two, Three. Without any further ado, I would like to introduce Lori and Amy. Lori Frankel is the New York Times bestselling and award-winning author of four novels. Her previous books are This Is How It Always Is, Goodbye For Now, and The Atlas of Love. Her novels have been translated into 25 languages and have been optioned for film and television. She is a former college professor, but she now writes full-time in the very cool city of Seattle, tongue-in-cheek there. She lives with her family, um, and she tells us that she makes good soup. She uh, she went to graduate school to study Shakespeare at the University of Delaware. And she also confided in me that she has never taken a creative writing class. I am sort of hoping that's not new news to Amy. Um, I am so honored that Amy Einhorn has agreed to join us for a second conversation with one of her authors. Amy is the president and publisher of Henry Holt and Company and has held many, many prestigious positions in New York publishing in her 30 years as publisher and editor. Amy and Lori have worked together for five years on one, two, three and her previous book and they will be working on a third book together um, in the near future. And I do wanna set one, set the record straight. Amy said the last time that we were together that she, that I don't always respond well to all of her books. And I want to um, redeem myself tonight because <laughs> my two favorite books of 2021 are her books, including one, two, three. Um, no, so that was a criticism. That was just like, you're very honest and it's, you're a tough customer. And I said that in very, in the best sense possible. Well, Amy, you've got me. And with that, um, I will turn it over to the two of you. Awesome. Um, well, thank you, Terry. Um, it's so nice to see you. I should just apologize to everybody. Um, so I was literally telling Lori and Terry about the last time I did one of these events a couple weeks ago. Um, we're in the process of moving. I live in New York City. We're moving and I had cleaned off sort of like a very nice presentable space. So it looked like my apartment was nice. And then five minutes before the event, they said, we can't really hear you. Can you go into a different room? So I got thrown into my two oldest daughter's rooms, which was a pigsty. And as I'm saying this, they're saying, oh, we really can't hear you. Can you switch rooms? So again, I'm in my two oldest daughter's rooms. And like you can see, we're moving and it's 97 degrees in New York and we didn't have an air conditioner in here because we thought we would have moved by now. So I do not look like New York City cool editor. <laughs> I apologize for that. You do, you look like New York City cool. I look New York City. So, and Lori, you are joining us from the very, um, very, the Pacific Dome of yes. Seattle? Yes, yes, and it also is, I, it might be nine, it might be down to 97 degrees. Uh, it was it was hotter than that before. And indeed, we have no air conditioning now or ever. But I do have three fans and I put the computer on a, like one of those things you cool cookies on, those, those racks of <laughs> so that, um, so it could have some air underneath so that we could get through this without the, because yesterday the computer wouldn't work because it was too hot. <laughs> That's really smart because this afternoon I was on a Zoom meeting and my, my, it was so hot that I had to put it on a pillow because it was burning my lap. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's really, it's, these are the things you never think about. Like, oh, there's going to be a global pandemic and also it's going to be 109 degrees um, without any air conditioning, but you got to, but you're going to be on book tour in your bedroom. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you as if, so we're gonna assume that people have not, we're gonna do no spoilers. And so we're not, we're gonna assume that people are either reading the book or have bought the book, but haven't finished it. And some of you will have finished it, but um, we're not gonna say exactly. So I'm also gonna to talk to you, Lori, as if we've never met before. So, <laughs> so you live in Seattle, you've written this novel. Now tell me what this novel is about. Okay. <laughs> 
<laughs> okay, I here's a thing that you might not know about me. I am a very, very bad actor. So I might not be able to fake this as well as you as you think I might be able to, but I'm gonna try. This book is, well, the elevator pitch I've been giving lately is it is about a very small town with a very dark past, which proves not to be so past after all. And my like slightly longer pitch if we were going to be on the elevator for more floors um, is that it's about triplets, three teenage sisters um, who have grown up in this very small town with this very dark past. Um, and and they are lived downstream from a chemical plant that was polluting their water before they were born on account of which fact they and and everyone they know has had some pretty significant challenges and um, and yet they have never known any differently. Uh, and when that chemical plant turns out to be somewhat less defunct than one might ideally hope, they have to take matters into their own hands. And then I think if we had our, our Hollywood pitch, at one point we were doing if I'm not mistaken, Aaron Brockovich meets Little Women. That's right. Yes, which I which I loved. It's a good I love it. Um, if I was in Hollywood, I, well, I actually did buy the book, so. Yes, um, you did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and you actually, did. I forgot. I'm sorry. Terry specifically had said to me, Amy, start by explaining what you do. Oh yeah. Okay. And the relationship to Lori. So I am the president of Holt, which is a <laughs> publishing company that was started in 1866. Um, I'm the first woman to ever run it, something I'm very, very proud of. Um, and, but I'm also, which is sort of unusual, I'm also an editor. So I still edit a couple of, you know, my beloveds, I would call them, and Lori is one of them. So um, editing, um, it depends. I'd be curious what Lori's take is on editing, because I think I'm helping Lori, and I think Lori and her husband and her daughter might think, <laughs> oh, that's the person who tortures Lori all the time. <laughs> So Laura, do you, want, do you want to talk about actually, I'd be curious how to hear your, how did this editing process go versus some, because you've written four books at this point, correct? Yes, I have. So how was this in relation to the other ones, easier, harder, are these like all different children and different personalities? I think that's exactly what it, you see, you, you say that like someone who has three children. I, I think that's exactly what it is. You know, I think every book is different and, and some books write easy and some books write hard and this book was, an enormous pain in the ass. Um, it it required a, a great deal of editing. Um, I think you know this, but for everyone else, I would not do this without you. I you are such a good editor, and um, and I and I would not and I would not do this any other way. Um, and 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 one of the reasons why you are such a good editor is because you're not doing line edits. You are saying like. This is not working here. <laughs> Something is not right. This is dragging. Fix it. And and that's that's what I want out of editing is uh, is is to be pointed to the things that that I can't see necessarily, but not to be told how because because that's my job. Well, and then, but I will say I'm going to defend you here for a second. I mean, I think one of the reasons when you're saying this book it was it wrote hard yeah. is that um, for people who haven't read it the. I, can you talk about how it's told? Because I think the narration and the POVs and how you do that is very complicated, not complicated. It actually reads incredibly not complicated, but it's in terms of actually writing it, it's an intricately sort of like everything is like a house of cards. And if you change one thing, everything else has to change. And I think it's actually incredibly brilliant and so ambitious what you were able to pull off so I don't know how you could have done that easily, but maybe, but I'm biased, of course, but can you explain to people what I'm talking about? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I think that it reads fairly simply now, but that is because, because we edited it so much. It is told in turns by these three different narrators who are triplets and indeed have grown up in the same house and with the same parent. Um, and so they have a lot of things in common and yet they are very different from one another. They navigate the world very differently from one another. And so they had to speak very differently from one another. Um, in early drafts, they all sounded the same and they all sounded like me. And, and that is no good because though I used to be a 16 year old girl, it's been 40 years and 30 years, 40 years, 30 years. Um, 30 years, unless you jumped ahead of me, I'm saying 30 years. <laughs> you can see the math is not necessarily my strong seat either. Um, 
and and indeed they it's it's told as a waltz it's part of where the title comes the title which is your title actually comes from that idea of it's one two three one two three which meant that I could not add a chapter without adding three and I couldn't take away a chapter without taking away three and um and and I thought I knew early on that this thing had to be narrated in the first person and had to be narrated in the present tense because they're teenage girls and so they live in the present and they're they're kind of myopic they you know they, they lead with themselves but that is not my inclination my inclination is to write in the third person in the past tense and a not necessarily linear, but but more linear than this kind of a narrative. And they each tell their own stories, each each story, and then they combine to to give this this over story. Um, and it was very very. And I had never done any of that before. It was a very complicated thing to to work out and to weave in and 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 bridge through such that you could um, keep turning pages, but also do all the things that needed doing. Well, but when you say that you had to add three or take away three, it's because, can you explain, so the first chapter, so there's, they're each narrating different chapters, yeah. but you're sort of, you have what, like narrator one, then narrator chapter two, chapter three, and then we start again with a, cha a chapter from chapter, from one's point of view. And actually, in fact, the girls refer to themselves as one, two, three, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yes. So they... They are their mother when she was pregnant and realized she was having triplets. Thought she was going to need some kind of device to tell them apart because uh, she was on her own by then. And three is a lot of children for for a single parent, especially this one. And so she gives them escalating syllables. So the first one is Mab, and the second one is Monday. She got two syllables, and the third one gets what Mab tells us is the normal name, Mirabelle three syllables, and um, and therefore, they, those are their nicknames too. They call each other one, two, three. And um, and yeah, they each get their own their own chapter and they get them in turns. So when we get to the end of three, we start ever again with with one. They, I think of it as a chorus, um, that they, that they, it's a choral telling that they, they combine to, to tell this, this story together. And, um, and it is also, um, what happens, I guess, at the end of the book without talking too much about what happens at the end of the book, that they, each of the three of them contribute the thing that only she can to, to cause what happens at the end to, to happen, to contribute to, to what they need to do to move forward. Okay, I have so many questions for you. So first of all, <laughs> one thing though, just as like from a marketing standpoint, I wanted to say, but that's actually very fun, which sounds like it might not be in terms of like the chemical plant, but they're actually quite like the girls are actually very humorous. Like they all have a very strong sense of humor, especially Mirabelle actually. Yeah, um, they are. They're very funny. They're funny. And and I think that's what happens with character is is that um, what starts off as, as, as a fairly bleak uh, setup and subject matter, in fact, becomes funny and loving by virtue of developing character. As soon as, as soon as they become real people, as soon as they're in relationships, then, then there is all of this love and, and humor and hope that comes out of it naturally. It, it, it wasn't um, like we went back and tried to put it, like we thought like, oh, this book is too much of a bummer. Let's, let's try to put some things in to, to, make, it bet, to make it happier, to make it more uplifting. It, it, it just kind of happens, I think, as you as you develop character. And, and I think the other thing that happened over the course of editing it was that the bad guys also got much more ambiguous and, and they had an argument and they made that argument and, you know, it was sort of compelling. So all of, I think all of the edges get sanded off on either end um, and therefore it becomes less, uh, less depressing and less, and less bleak, but also less, um, enraging i think you're less angry i think you i hope that you get to the end and feel more uplifted because of those things okay so i'm gonna pivot for a second because i'm just thinking I, i'm thinking in particular there's what so Lori and i've worked together i've had the privilege of working with Lori for i don't know how many years at this point has it been five i think it's been five 
five or six, yeah. And Lori is the most modest person in the world. So I'm like, did you do anything interesting last week? She's like, no. And then I show her, like someone had sent me a picture. It's a picture of Lori flanked by Hillary and Chelsea Clinton because Lori had just happened to sort of do their event and ne never mentioned it to me. So in Seattle, where you live, you kind of have become like a go-to person in the community in terms of for hosting and moderating events from other authors, correct? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a really nice thing to be able to, well, back when we used to have events, um, it was really lovely for the, for the bookstores to be able to call and say, sometimes the bookstore calls and says, hey, will you do this event? I bet you would like this book. And I say, oh, I loved that book. But often they say, would you do this event? Because I think you would love this person, or I think you would love this book. Or, I think you would be good for this. And it's not anybody I know or a book that I have read yet. Um, I mean, I had heard of Hillary Clinton. So that was really the exception. But sometimes I haven't. And then that's really great because you get to meet people who you wouldn't otherwise and talk about books, which is my favorite thing to do. But this is also why you are beloved by authors because on your last book, This Is How It Always Is, we had quotes from, oh my gosh, everybody. Um, Leon Moriarty, um, oh my gosh, remind me, um, the, um, Jamie Ford, Maria Semple. I mean, it just sort of went on and on. Yeah, I mean, it's, I was very lucky. Very, very lucky. lucky. You weren't lucky, it's good karma, but also because you're well, a good writer. So here's my question is, so one thing that struck me is, so um, we know that you live in Seattle with your husband and your daughter, but in this novel, there's three daughters. And in your last novel, there were five <laughs> boys, one of whom becomes a girl. Right. And I'm just realizing like, what is the fascination with big families given that you, unless, and you, I believe it's you and your brother, right? Sister, I have one sister. sister. It's true, okay. yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing is I think it's probably easier to raise pretend children than actual children <laughs> um, and cheaper probably also um i you know they well it's not quite that they do what you tell them to because they don't always but it but i think you have a little bit more more control over the children you make up um i am really compelled by by big families and and non-traditional families, you know, people who aren't actually related. Um, I always want to do more, and so the struggle for me is always how to how to make the book not 600 pages long. How to uh, how to make it so that you can keep track of all of the characters. Um, how to make it so that everyone gets developed and and everyone gets equal time. You know, in this one, I was so so careful to make sure that you know Mirabelle, who uses a wheelchair and has you know but her one hand and arm that she has control over and and does not speak you know she requires um, a machine to to speak but i wanted to make sure that she had just as much um interaction with other people and just as many relationships with other characters and just as many trips out of the house and um you know and just as much active time as everybody else that it wasn't a, a question of you know she was just observing or she was all in her head and um and the best way i can ever think of to do that is more characters if i could have done six sisters I, I would have but it would have been overwhelming i think um i i always in early drafts combine lots of different characters uh, i sort of reduce them like sauce down to one um i like to have lots of characters i would have i would have three children too if i could do but that is not a I situation will which i find you, myself at one point i don't know if it was you that i once was talking to an author and they said you know, I always remember what it is you said to me. And I'm like, what did I say to you? And they were like, it would, and it was so shocking to me because I'm like, none of my girls listen to me, but my authors do. And I'm like, so <laughs> um, but, but my question to you would be, um, first of all, can you tell us like, what is your, and I actually don't know if I know that you and I touch base in different periods. What is your writing process? So like, can you take us everything from what was the genesis of the book and then how does that sort of then manifest itself? Because I have some authors who are like, I sit at the de I get at my computer and I'm here from nine to five every day. And then I have other authors who are like, I go for walks and they're <laughs> counting that as that's really actually them working on the book. You know, they're yeah. really thinking about stuff and they might only write for two hours a day. Yes. This is a really great question to which I no longer know the answer because my kid hasn't left the house since March of 2020. 
<laughs> it used to be that she went to school and that was super exciting. And while she was out of the house, I would work always. And that was a practice that I developed when, I mean, when she was in daycare and like there were limited hours and I was only going to get, you know, she was a baby. She couldn't take my eyes off of her. You know, I was only going to get two hours or something while she was in nursery school. And so I would sit down and write and not move for that, for that time. And, and I have stuck with that, 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 that practice has worked for me. So when she used to go to school, I would, I would start, I would come home from carpool and start writing and then do that until I picked her up again. And then I would spend all of the other time when I was cooking dinner or walking the dog or taking a shower or whatever, figuring out what I was going to do when I sat down the next day to write. Um, now... <laughs> I write in 15 minute increments between the computer crashing because somebody wasn't showing their camera during algebra and flute practice not being able to go ahead because she cannot find the flute. Um, I assume I will go back to, to writing uh, in, a, in a more extended way than that if she ever goes back to school next year. Um, and, and thus I have a draft. It is too long and it is really terrible. It is really, really terrible and long. Um, and there, and then I make it better. And I go back to the beginning and write to the end. And I go back to the beginning and write to the end. And I edit it and edit it and edit it and edit it until it is about as good as I can get it. And then I send it to you. <laughs> um, so maybe, <laughs> then maybe you should say what happens after that. Well, I, I do. Um, I, I have another author, Jenny Lawson, and she's a memoirist. And she always described the editing. And she's a she's very funny. And she described the editing process where she works on this book and she works on it for you know nine months, and it's literally like her baby. And she hands the baby to me, and I say, "Oh, this baby is so unbelievably cute." <laughs> and then I like cut off its legs and cut off its arms, and I hand it back to her, and I say, "But isn't it so much cuter now?" <laughs> Well, yes, actually, it's that. It's been so much cuter now, and but now it can't walk, so you need to fix that. <laughs> so there is, yeah, there's a lot of back and forth. I did want to ask you, Lori, and I'm curious. This is so fun for me because we never get to really talk about <laughs> process awesome. or about yeah. like crap. You know, I know a lot of authors will say, "Well, I wrote the book that I wanted to read that that didn't exist," right. and I'm curious because I know we've talked about thematically if you could talk about what your last book was about, and I know that this book, even though it's not a, it's not a sequel and is not in some respects completely different, thematically are very much linked. And I, I was wondering if you could talk about why you're particularly drawn to writing about um, this, these groups, which are very different, but also I think very similar. Yeah, interesting. It's such a good question. Um, why I am drawn to. So the last book, this is how it always is, is about a family of five boys, the youngest of whom becomes a girl. So it's about a, a transgender kid. Um, I have a transgender kid who is not the kid in the book. And, um, and in fact, the family in the book has very little in common with mine in one, in the first place, because as you say, they have five children and I have one, one child. Um, but also because I am very lucky to be living a fairly plot-free existence. Um, and that is no good for your novel. Um, it's great for your life and your parenting, but it's no good for your novel. So you have to keep turning pages. And so it needed all of this like plot and drama and heartbreak, um, which I am very blessed not to be living with. So, um, so, it, so it, was all made, it was all made up, but it was very much a fantasy, I suppose, of, of, of the world that I hope that my kid gets to grow up in. And, and the best way for me to cause that world to occur is to write it. Um, that, that is what I hope. Wider ranges of normal. Make the world better for everyone, I think. And that indeed is the point I keep coming back to. All, everything I write somehow boils down to that idea, wider, wider ranges of normal, that this thing that you think is, is weird about you and, and kind of embarrassing and, and possibly shameful is in fact this way for everyone. And though the particulars vary, the, that overriding idea 
is true for everybody. And therefore, the more we can celebrate that, um, the better everything is for everybody. So this book is, as you say, a very, very wildly different book. Um, but it is very much about that. One of the things it is about is about disability and um, the ways in which disability is often presented to us as as very abnormal and as and perhaps as, as something that is wrong. Um, and and the, this book, I, ho I hope, um, these girls want to argue that, that that is actually not true, um, that it requires looking at disability a different way. Um, and it is something that they're able to do because their town is indeed very unusual. They are they're living someplace that is that is quite unlike where you are living and where I am living, um, because it too is is a fantasy in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, Mab one spends a lot of time thinking that her town um, is is this you know very sad and backwards place, and that if only she lived somewhere else, her sixteen year old life would be full of exciting people and and beautiful people and wonderful things to do. Because it's only like this, it's only boring and tiresome where she is, um, and and therefore. She she needs some, some people to come from outside and tell her, no, no, this is the state of being 16. This is how it is everywhere. And, and something I never thought about, Lori, but I am curious, you wrote, this is how it is. Um, so let's see, I'm trying to think when you were writing that book, what was where we were politically in the country. Right. But it's interesting because I would never have, if I was talking about you, I wouldn't say Lori writes books that are political or that have anything to do with politics, but yet talking to you all of a sudden, I'm like, oh my gosh, Amy, of course these were all driven by what was going on in the world because in terms of like, I remember having conversations with you just personally about what was going on, having a trans child, but then also now, and I'm just curious, were you cognizant of that? And I'm just really late to the game that I wasn't <laughs> realizing what was going on. <laughs> um, I think less of the first time and more this time. And it's very interesting that that both of these books, the world changed between my between that book leaving my hand and and coming out and hitting bookstores. Um, the first time, because when I handed this book in, we all assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to be president, and then it, the book came out three days after inauguration. Um, we went downtown and marched, and then we went to the bookstore and launched the book, and. Um, and then this one, you know, of course, it was in, and and we were done. And then, and then the world changed again. And then there was a global pandemic that really no one saw coming. Um, this book is not about a plague. The book is sort of about an apocalypse, I suppose, but but not in a traditional sense. Um, th this book is about environmental injustice. Um, so it was very timely in that way. I don't know. For me, I guess the the political bent, the timely part. I, I feel like what we've learned this year is is that the world is very small and we are very connected and we have this responsibility to our community and to one another that we forget at our peril. And and that is very much what this book is about. Um, the the people in this in this community do not do not always get along. They do not always agree. They have definitely um, had more than their fair share of terrible things, but it is a really wonderful community in a lot of ways. And I think a very appealing place to live in, in a lot of ways because they support one another and they do it in really um, insistent, creative, urgent sorts of ways. I guess I was thinking less about COVID, but more I was just thinking without venturing into politics too much, but you know, it was fairly well publicized when the former president mocked the disabled, the um, disabled reporter, um, and then also just the environmental bent of the book. So, which I hadn't really thought about that you were writing this in response to that, but it certainly must have colored how you were thinking about things. Yeah. For sure, I, you know, it was sparked by by a newspaper article. I in in January 2016, I, I read an article in the New York Times Magazine by Nathaniel Rich about uh, about a small town in West Virginia downstream from a chemical company and the lawyer who had been suing on behalf of the citizens for 25 years and counting. And I thought that was astonishing, and I could not stop thinking about it. Um, I just I. 
I thought that was really remarkable. And it is remarkable. But in fact, what was remarkable about it is the tenacity of, of the citizens and the lawyer, but not, as it happens, the polluting. Um, because once, once I saw this article and once I started thinking about it and, and started paying attention, it, it took but opening up a newspaper every day to see these, these articles about about towns all over the country and indeed all over the world um, who have been victims of catastrophic environmental catastrophe that is that is actually due to corporate malfeasance um, that is it's not a, it's not accidental it's, it's sort of it's systemic it's baked in um, and and that is horrifying and also I mean indeed it is it is remarkable it is it is everywhere. And one of the things that we talked about a lot um, was my desire to not locate this town anywhere in particular because this this is happening everywhere. The, the other kind of Hollywood spin on this that we floated for a while was we all live downstream. And and indeed, I think that this is true, that if you think your water is, is clean and so this isn't a problem that is affecting you, like unfortunately, your water probably has this stuff in it too. Um, but I think, you know, more to the point than, you know, this is what I was saying a minute ago, like, I think we have a responsibility. I think we have a responsibility to one another um, to, to stand up um, against this kind of injustice. So you might not have a favorite character because I think that might be like asking, you know, a mother, like, who's your favorite kid? <laughs> Although, let's be honest, there's certain kids we like more at different times. <laughs> Um, which is what I told my girls. Um, so I will just say, uh, to me, Mirabelle, like I, I would read the phone book of Mirabelle if she was doing the narration for it, because I just think she was such an amazing character. And I'm curious if by her being so completely other than you, yeah, was she in a way one word, did you feel more creative with her? Or do you think that's just an, I, I'm just curious, it's interesting to me because I just think she steals the show. And I'm curious if you think that or if other people have said that. Uh, I, I, I keep telling everybody I that. I just think one thing actually, but as opposed to a lot of times where you have books where different um, narrators, and sometimes you're like, I want to get through this person because I don't like, I happen to love all of the girls. And like every, I kept saying to people, that it was bizarre because I wanted to just sort of move to this town. Yeah. And I was saying how I kind of actually edited the book more than I probably needed to because I didn't want to let go of it because there was something so comforting because this happened right at the beginning of the, I think you handed it in, right? Like at the beginning of the pandemic and I couldn't read actually, which is a horrible admission for a book editor. And the only thing I could read was your book. And there was this comfort of being in this town and this community where they were so loving and just so, it just was like this bomb um, yeah. and this solve. But anyway, I'm sorry, but I'm sort of going on and on. But like, I did find Mirabelle, I think might it might have also been like, she's had all of these things happen to her. And yet she has such a wonderful, um, she's funny and she's so smart and she's this great disposition, not in a hallmarky kind of like, right. Sorry, I'm talking too much, but I'm curious what your thoughts are on her. No, you're, you're talking the perfect amount, uh, especially if you want to say nice things like that. Um, I, and I keep telling everybody that Mirabelle is your favorite. And it's, it's interesting because people have, people have really different, everybody likes somebody different, which, I, which I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled they do. Otherwise, I'd feel bad for one of them if nobody loved her. I would I'd feel really sad about that. Um, I think... I don't know, maybe you don't. I think I have equal things in common with, with each of the three of them. Like, I think I broke myself up into three parts and, and, and put, a, put a third into, into each of them. Um, so indeed, I mean, Mirabelle has, has only one hand and one arm that she can use. And, um, and she spends most of her time in a wheelchair and, and she requires a machine to speak. And in this way, She's, her life is very, 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 very different than mine. And she navigates the world very differently than I do. Um, she is a genius and I am not a genius, but I am smarter than I was when I was 16. <laughs> so one of the problems in early drafts was that these girls just, they, 
they were unbelievably smart. They they were smart in a way you didn't quite believe because um, because they sounded too much like me. And um, and I've learned a few things since then. And so um, so I, I got to give her all of the I got to give her all of the smart. Um, all of the so the her language I didn't have to dial her language back which which I did with Mav and Monday um, her language got to come out of my brain and stay and stay more or less the same she's very funny and um, and she's and she's very curious and she is a writer and um, and a reader and a writer and and navigates the world that way and and of course so do I so while I certainly have a much more facility, um, ease of, of navigating all sorts of aspects of life than she does. Um, in lots of ways, I do feel like that, that kernel of turning to writing or reading other people's writing to figure stuff out is something that I channeled for her. So tell, do you read other people while you're writing? Because I have some people who will say I can't read other stuff while I'm writing. Um, yeah. And I'm also curious, but or and or would you read Shakespeare? Because Shakespeare does come up in the book. Um, Shakespeare does come up in the book. <laughs> um, I, yes, I mean, yes and yes. I read constantly. I'm always, always, always reading. I'm usually writing while I'm reading. Like I usually have the laptop in my lap and a book next to me on the sofa or the laptop on the desk and the book on my lap so that I can read while I'm writing. Um, I do know too, lots of people who don't read while they're writing, but I don't know how because I feel like my brain gets, like I don't know what the next sentence is, but if I read someone else's next sentence then I remember how to get from one sentence to the next sentence and and that's how I know what to do. Um, and yeah, I also, well, this one has a lot of Romeo and Juliet in it. So, so yeah, I, I did reread re Romeo and Juliet for the three, four hundredth time, I would guess. <laughs> um, and, you know, there's no amount of, of reading Shakespeare that will help you to write like that, unfortunately. But um, it is good, I think, for your, for your brain to be on that cadence to, to be hearing language work that way. Um, I think like it lubricates the, the wheels somehow. I'm just laughing. So I remember, I think I called you from, this was during like the height of the pandemic where I was taking a walk with my 15 year old daughter. And I was, I had said, I had this great idea, you know, since you're doing school <laughs> remotely and everything, what about if, Lori Frankel and I taught this class together. We could teach a class about writing. And she <laughs> burst into tears and she's like, you have to promise me you will not call my school and offer that. <laughs> the worst idea ever you've ever had. And please, please do not do that. Teenagers. <laughs> and so then I think I said to Lori, like, well, I could do it for Danny and you could do it for Lori, for, for Goli, but we can't do it for our own kids. <laughs> But I am curious, Lori, because you also were a professor of gender studies, correct? And I am curious because in the book, you know, um, Mav in particular, I think says, I forget this saying, but it's basically sort of how people sort of discount teenage girls. Right. And I wanted to ask you about that. And I also wanted to ask you on a larger um, realm, if you have felt that as being a, a female writer. Oh. God, yes, Maybe and yes. You don't have enough time for that question. Maybe that's a whole <laughs> other like series of questions of series of ones. <laughs> yeah, or it's like over lunch. Um, but or yeah, let's let's do the easy one first. Um, yeah, it's it's early on. I think it's the end of the I think it's the end of Mirabelle's first chapter um, where she says teenage girls get written off, they get ignored um, at, because so she's up with her sisters the night before high school starts back up again, essentially gossiping, like talking about talking about friends and and people they've run into and things they've seen around town. And she's saying, you know, that gets written off as being girls overanalyzing and picking things to death. Um, it is belittled, it is ignored, um, it is written off as silly. And she's saying, in fact, it's the most important thing because it is listening to other people, listening 
to other people's stories, listening to what other people have to say. Um, and what she says is, you have to pay attention or else you'll miss it. Um, it's slow, like I am, she says, but if you're not paying attention, um, then you'll can miss I, it all together. Can, can I read it? Yeah. <laughs> um, we don't need something to have happened to talk about though. Teenage girls don't get enough credit for this, their ability to see the potential import of everything, no matter how insignificant it seems and analyze it endlessly. It's written off, we're written off, it's silly, but it's the, op but it's the opposite. We understand instinctively that, like me, change is slow. If you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. What is that, like page seven? Um, page seven. Oh my God, you're good. Page seven. <laughs> yeah, I edited this book a lot. <laughs> but I should point out, hopefully you people in the audience was, Lori's such a good writer. I mean, she's <laughs> such a beautiful writer. The book is filled with stuff like this. You just, it's it's so good. But anyway, keep going, Lori. Um, you know, it, it seems like an important thing to say at the beginning of the book. It's a book about teenage girls. So um, pay attention or else you'll miss it. And, you know, and indeed that's, that's basically what the book is about. Um, they, they do pay attention. They do go slow. Um, and therefore they have a mystery to solve and um, clues to gather and very difficult situations to surround. And they do it, but they do it as teenage girls. Um, the other thing I've been telling people about this book is that it is about how girls superhero. And that is very different than the superhero movies and stories that we usually get. Um, the superhero stories that we usually get are very, very male and they're very solitary. And they um, involve a lot of super strength and a lot of super physical prowess and a lot of super speed. And um, they're not very realistic and for my money, they are not very interesting. Um, I think they're, I think they're boring stories, uh, and and they're ubiquitous. They're everywhere, and and that is not how girls superhero. Girls carry as they climb. They work together. They listen to each other. Um, and if you and if you ignore that, and if you write it off, then then you're going to miss what happens. So, so that is that is the other thing that this book is about for me. Um, it is a it is a story about have that how teenage girls are going to save the world um yeah that's that that's what boils down to for me and but can you talk also a little bit about in terms of i i sort of it's a very big subject but i am curious because i think i'm smarting because someone asked me an interview question about another author of mine who's a woman and i'm kind of just getting tired of people asking these questions where i feel like no one says men are writing men's fiction. No one talks about the fact that like, I have no idea how many kids James Patterson has or any of these people, but yet somehow that seems to always be part of the descriptive copy about, about female authors. So I'm yes. just curious if what your thoughts are, and I'm assuming that you and your colleagues, your contemporaries <laughs> have spoken about this. I mean, endlessly we have spoken about this. It is, it is a constant surprise to me, actually. Um, I persist in not getting uh, like less naive about this, which is itself sort of surprising. But in part, it's because you're such a badass. Um, and, and so is my agent. Um, it is an industry that is full of the strongest, smartest women I have ever worked with in in any industry um, and, and who really dominate that, that industry, um, you know, particularly by numbers and, and certainly readers also. I mean, you know, of course everyone reads, but, but women buy more books and women, you know, read more books um, than, than do men. And so, um, and as you say, I have taught a lot of gender. I have lived a lot. Of, I have a lot of gender going on in my household. Like there's a lot of gender questions these days. Um, and so it's something that I think about a lot and therefore it continues to surprise me um, the extent to which one sometimes also feels um, as Mirabelle, like, you know, sort of ignored and written off and as if, you know, this isn't really important. Um, because it is readable, because it is relationship-based, because it is 
like loving and uplifting, um, that that makes it somehow less than, um, that that makes it easier to ignore the, the messages and the, and the themes. And, you know, and of course I find that, uh, like frustrating and, um, angering of course, but also just kind of shocking. Um, it is certainly what I want to, what I want to read and I'm, I am a very good reader. Um, and, and so it is, it is always surprising to me when it comes up, um, with the last book in particular, it was very surprising. I mean, there was, the reviews were so good and I'm so, so, so grateful for them. However, full stop, new paragraph, it's interesting to me that, um, that some people felt like, oh, you know, sh she was too close to that story. And, and then some people felt like, oh, well, you know, she, was, she, had, she made that up and so she was too far away from that story, like vis-a-vis -vis my own parenting. And, and that's, you know, those two things are opposites and, and have really actually nothing to do with writing fiction. Right, which is, but fiction, that's such a loaded thing right now, right? But, um, but, um, but I am just thinking of, I, I heard, I don't know if I heard or I read, Glennon Doyle was saying that when women write um, books about, um, I forget how she phrased it, but she said, we write, we're, we're, it's called that we're doing self-help, but when men do it, it's called leadership books. Right, yeah, right. Well, or that, that the difference between literary to fiction and domestic fiction, um, that, that sometimes when men write books about families, um, they're writing the great American novel and, you know, and it is family as a metaphor for, I don't know, whatever. Um, but that, that women are just, you know, transcribing their, their day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, they're just writing down what it feels like to cook dinner every night. And I, you know, and I think that's, I mean, I think on the face of that, that seems, you know, absurd to me. And, and in fact, though, what I think is that on the face of it is it, it is absurd. It's just that it's insidious. And so, um, you know, we have the fallout and we don't look at it because we know that's not true. It's the, it's what's happening below there where, you know, where we're not really thinking about it, it as critically as, as I wish we were. So can I ask you the Lord, cause you said it's so surprising, but then I'm wondering not to be all negative, but is <laughs> just in terms of there is a level of misogyny going on. So is it surprising or is it just surprising given that if you're saying in the world of publishing where you would think it would be a higher plane, hopefully. Yeah, that's what I think. I think it should be a higher plane. I, you know, I think that um, I think you are are better at what you do than en than anyone I know is at what they do, and and that should be enough. Um, I think that people who read books and um, buy books are thoughtful, critical thinking. Um, you know, people who have examined their biases and and would and strive to you know make the world better, um, and and that therefore um, you know we should all be very enlightened, <laughs> we should be more enlightened more quickly. I think um, you know, and I don't know. I think some of it is that you. It's a funny thing because. For so long, the book just lives in your head, and and on your computer, and and then it goes to a very select number of people who who will love it and nurture it, and then you send it out into the world, and you want people to feel about it exactly the way that you intend for them to. Um, so it's a control issue, maybe, <laughs> and um, and and when that response is. Um, mitigated by other factors, that is a that is a very jarring journey, I think. So someone asked on the chat if you could talk about a book you've liked, and actually, I'm just gonna I was gonna ask you also in terms of how you have a community of writers who you're friends with, because Shoba Rayo, who's a wonderful writer, and um, I should and I'll. All Transparency is one of my other authors, but 
um, is an incredibly um, amazing writer who wrote an amazing novel called Girls Burn Brighter. Um, and I know that you two have become friendly. And I'm just curious in terms of how does that work? Like, how do you actually, because it's such a solitary thing that you all do, how do you forge those relationships? And then if you could answer someone's question and talk about a book you like. Oh yeah, gosh, I, I could talk all day long about books I would like. Um, but Girls Burn Brighter is a really great place to start because I loved that book. And I read it before I met Shoba because you sent it to me um, because she was coming into town. And um, and that is that is something that happens to me more these days where I have read somebody's book and then and then I meet them. But certainly um, the, the reverse, I think, as you get to know lots of people happens more often. Like you know them and you love them and then you read their book. So, of course, you love their book. Um, Shoba, I loved her book and I loved her characters before I even met her. And I mean, and she, too, is writing fiction it's it's pretend it is it isn't it was not about her it was not, it's not autobiographical at all um so it is not that i felt like i knew her because i had read her story it's that i felt like i knew her because i had read her her heart i had read her words um and um and i had and i had been with her on this on this journey so when i met her i i loved her immediately and and then yes then we became friends um and you know and it is like sometimes you meet people because you interview them and then you know like you go to your circle you don't necessarily keep in touch um but show and i were very lucky to do a writer's retreat together and and to be teaching together and um which is a very bonding experience i think and so now i have someone to to call and talk to about you know, the highs and lows of, of drafting and, and revision um, and to read each other's work uh, in the early stages before it's ready for other people's eyes. Um, and just to talk about the, I mean, it's a roller coaster. It's a, it is an emotionally challenging thing. And, um, and yet it is something that, God, I'm so, we're so lucky to do it. Um, so it's not, it, it, it doesn't work to complain to most people about it. Um, and so it's nice to have, it's nice to have somebody to talk to about it. I mean, it is also, um, I think, a very special thing to um, share an editor with someone. It's, it, it, is, it is an interesting relationship. And, and she's my first on that front. Um, and we were at this with the writing retreat with like six other women. And, um, and you know, we're in the going around and saying, oh, how do you know each other? And we're saying, oh, we share an editor. And everyone's like, oh, that's so nice. Because it is. I mean, it's like a long lost sibling. Um, it, you know, it is this bond, this thing that you have in common that, um, that, that you will not have in common with most people. It is very special. So you can bond when you guys complain about me than going my daughter do. <laughs> do not complain about you. Sometimes we're afraid, but when there's no complaining. Again, something my girls are not, never afraid of me. <laughs> now I'm curious, so does this mean like, is like Hillary your BFF? Are you guys like, you're just like texting with Hillary at night? No, but I wish that that were true. I, I do wish that that were true. Um, we should be BFFs, right? You totally should, should be, be texting at night. Yeah, I think that that's, that's a good goal going forward. So who was your favorite author to interview? Well, I mean, Hillary and Chelsea Clinton were pretty, were pretty fantastic. Um, it was a, it was a larger book event that I'm used to. It, there were, it was a ballroom of like maybe a thousand people. I think that's probably uh, a small venue for them, but it was a large venue for me. <laughs> um, so it was really, I mean, it was my, it was my deepest honor to get to do it, but I was very nervous. I was, um, I was a little bit beside myself nervous. So I, uh, it was something of an out of body experience really. Um, so, so interviewing, so talking to Shova was a lot more relaxing <laughs> um, than, than, than talking to Hillary Clinton was. Um, and you know, it's, it is very interesting. Um, the, the, people who you talk to and then and then they come back and do that for you. So earlier on this tour last week, I was um, doing this in conversation with Rufy Thorpe, um, whose, whose novel I loved and whose novel kicked off this pandemic for me. Um, she was the first she was the first event I, I moderated for, but she was actually the first online event I attended back when we all thought like, well, what if we use this new thing called Zoom to do book tour? And, um, and so I got to talk to her about hers and, and then a whole year passed and, um, and then she got to talk to me about mine and, and that's really fun. Hold on, I'll show you that book because it's right here next to me. This okay. is a really good book for Californians. I know that lots of people on this call are Southern Californians. This is the book for you. 
the knockout queen. Okay. Uh, to this book. So I know we're getting the we're getting the Academy Award sort of music soon. <laughs> so, um, my question to you would be if um, there was only one thing that you could tell someone about your book, or actually forget that. That's that's too, like what do you hope people gain from the book? Like what do you hope that when they come away from reading it, without sounding Pollyanna-ish, but is there something that you hope people get from the book yeah and that's exactly what it is I don't it sounds too Pollyanna-ish to me it sounds very cheesy but I hope that people feel inspired and empowered um and um without giving too much away I think that the the ending of this book the 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 thing that is learned through the course of this book is that um just because you can't see it yet and just because the odds are stacked against you doesn't mean there's not another way through and that indeed is the is is the challenge is is it, you can't do it the way you've been told to do it you can't do it the way it's always been done you can't do it the way your mom did it because none of those things are going to work you gotta they find their they find their own way um and and it is it is by by looking someplace different um and i i hope that that is really empowering because i think that you know we spend a lot of time especially of late feeling despair and despair in this way of like but there's nothing i can do about it and i and i think that that's a really dangerous place to be because that's how you learn to live with things that instead you should fight so i hope that the book is a you know is a call to arms just different different kind of arms and a different kind of call well i'll just say that um and um lori's um First of all, I think you do. You finish this book. And again, like I read this at probably like one of the darkest times I've ever been in. And it was like literally the medicine I needed. Um, and then also, um, but since we're sharing Lori's last book, this is how it always is. I should say that there, um, there was a member of my family who um, um, announced that they were trans and that they're transitioning. And my mother who is now 83, who I would have thought would have had a very, and I should think she's liberal, but you know, like she's 83. And she said to me, she said, you know, I want so-and-so to read Lori's book. She said, because she, and like, she totally got it. And I don't think she would have gotten it before she read your book. I mean, I know for a fact she wouldn't have, like she, she, reading that book really did change how she viewed the world. Um, and I know it did for me. And I think this book did as well. So I just want to thank you so much because, um, it's such an honor to work with you and um, for everyone in the audience, I hope you buy Shoba's book. I hope you buy Lori's book and not because they're my, they're my authors, <laughs> but they're just both such gifted writers. And I think they're telling important stories about, about girls and about people who, whose society is overlooking. And I think that's kind of why we're doing what we're doing. I, uh, Amy, Lori, I, okay. I just, I, I, do not want to stop this warm and wonderful conversation. And I'm incredibly grateful to you, but give me a second to do one bit of housekeeping. And then um, I want to thank you properly. Um, I want everyone to know who purchased a general admission ticket that that your the price of admission can be used um, toward a purchase of any of Lori's um, books, either one, two, three, or her backlist. Um, and I, I think that Lauren will put the, the uh, coupon code, which is just Frankel. Um, and before we close, I, I do just, because I have an audience, have to mention that we have one upcoming event in July with Paula McLean. She will be joining us to discuss her latest book and her first mystery, When the Stars Go Dark. And Lauren will put a link to that ticket in chat. So I just wanna thank everyone for coming tonight um, and can, and I look forward to continuing the conversation in the fall with hopefully in-person events. And, and I want to thank Amy and Lori for doing what they do, for being who they are, and for joining us tonight. So thank you so much, everyone. And good night. Thank, thank you so you. much, everyone.